Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is Joel Lackett at the North Climate Science Center. Thanks for joining the monthly check-in. Um, today we have Dave Anderson of the Colorado Natural Heritage Program here. Um, he's the director at the CNHP um, here at Colorado State University. And he will be talking about partnerships to address climate change vulnerability and adaptation. So welcome, Dave. Thank you, Jill. And uh, thanks to everyone here at the North Central Climate Science Center for inviting us to do a presentation about this. So, um, let's see, do I just probably go forward? Yeah, you can use the arrows or the click through. Yeah, you're okay. okay. Well, um, I'm just going um, to. Oh, uh, you have to. Sorry, have to click on the. Yeah, and then all right. There we okay. go. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, I'm I'm gonna start off uh, and just tell you some stories about what CNHP does because I think a lot of you on the phone might not be fully aware of the scope of our program's work, and then get into the work that we're doing on climate change vulnerability and adaptation. Um, so. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of uh, touch on uh, four different key climate change vulnerability and adaptation projects that we're a part of. Um, and on all of these projects, um, we are uh, working in big teams, uh, especially in the Social Ecological Climate Resilience Group and the Gunnison Working Group. Those are both huge teams, and we are but a part of these huge teams. So if um, if when I'm talking about those projects, I say the word we, um, it is we, Sinsu Lato, um, talking about a very large group of people. So, um, I'll just, uh, tell you a little bit about CNHP first. We are a sponsored program here at Colorado State University. We have 24 uh, full or nearly full-time staff who are uh, scientists, uh, researchers, and educators here at the university. Um, uh, so being at the university is an opportunity that we have really uh, been increasing in terms of the involvement of students at our program. We have lots of students who are uh, working with us um, in various capacities as scholars, um, doing uh, theses with us, or as interns, uh, work studies, volunteers. Our systems administrator on the lower right corner is a CSU computing science student. So we have lots of students working with us at any given time, especially in the summer. Um, and that's made convenient for them by the fact that we're right here on campus, right across the street from NESB, um, from the little porch on NESB. You can look out and see our building. We're just right there. Um, and we're part of the Warner College of Natural Resources at CSU. Um, in terms of what does CNHP do, we do a whole lot of things that are connected to conservation management and development and supporting those in Colorado. Um, so I just threw in a few examples to give you some feeling for the scope of the work our program is doing. And, and this is one, um, uh, it's a partnership with Colorado Coalition of Land Trusts and CSU's geospatial centroid. Um, and this is a, a map of the protected areas of Colorado, which includes all of the um, private land protected areas, conservation easements. And this is the only comprehensive source of these data in Colorado. So this is uh, something that we're doing in partnership. Um, we've stood it up as a subscription service now with a grant from Great Outdoors College. And we also have uh, all, uh, we completed the digital wetland map of Colorado using NWI data um, and turned those paper maps into an interactive digital map that you can get to through our website. Um, and that was uh, also done through a, a lot of different partnerships, especially with Southern Rockies LCC um, and Parks and Wildlife and Fish and Wildlife Service and EPA. Um, and we're also trying to help people manage wetlands through providing resources like these. The Field Guide to Colorado's Wetlands Plants is a book that you can buy at the CSU bookstore. Um, we also have a free app 
for Android and uh, Apple that you can download in the App Store. You just type Colorado Wetlands, you'll find it. It's free and it's awesome and has little interactive map features. It can show you a map of where the wetlands are near you and then you can connect that to the wetland plants that are found in those wetlands. It's a fun little tool. Um, and we're doing things like this. Uh, this is a landscape disturbance index that we use to kind of try to understand threats to biodiversity in Colorado. So uh, we're doing a lot of different kinds of models um, using uh, GIS to help uh, set conservation priorities and strategies. Um, so these are these are some of the things that our program does, and and. Uh, we're kind of uniquely capable of doing things like that at the Colorado Natural Heritage Program in that we're part of the university. We have a lot of latitude in, in the directions that we can go and the sources of funding we can procure. Um, but we're part of this network, so we kind of have this double identity. We're part of Colorado State University, but we're also part of this global network of programs that are organized as members of NatureServe, which is a nonprofit based in Arlington, Virginia at the star on this map. Um, there's a, a constituent program in every state and in all of the Canadian territories and provinces and in 16 Latin American countries. Um, so these 83 members of the Nature Surf Network um, all uh, have the, the same role of identifying conservation priorities within their jurisdictions and mapping those priorities and keeping track of how they're doing. Um, most of the programs in the network are part of a state department of departments of natural resources. Um, but quite a few of them are also parts of universities or have other arrangements. Um, Montana, Wyoming, and New Mexico are all university-based programs. And it's interesting that a lot of the university-based programs are larger and, and have more different kinds of things that we do. And so that characterizes all four of those programs. So, uh, yeah, so in that role as a heritage program, it's that membership to that network and that role of identifying uh, locations and keeping track of the status of conservation targets that makes us a heritage program. So this is a map of all of the um, animals, plants, and natural communities that we track in Colorado. Um, we track them on maps as detailed polygons, but here we've converted them to centroids, put them on the map so that you can see them. And you will see that, that you're, there's nowhere you can go in Colorado where you're not close to something that is a target for biodiversity conservation that our program has identified. And so that's the role that our program's been playing since our inception in 1979. We've been at CSU ever since 1994 and we've been doing this. So we continue to grow work to keep it updated and, and of course share it with our partners. Um, everything we do happens through partnerships and we're funded by partnerships. We don't get any hard funding from the state or the university. It's all soft funded, generated constantly through partnerships and projects. And these are some of our really key partners right now, but there is way more than I could fit on a slide. Um, these are just some of them. So, um, and those partners, uh, fund projects with us. Some of them consume those data that I was that we were just looking at in various ways and use those to guide their conservation activities. Um, so just to kind of summarize that, you know, what we just saw on that map is the track locations of animals, plants, and plant communities. And when we track a species or a plant community, we're keeping track of where it is and how it's doing. And one of the key ways we do that is uh, through methods developed by the Nature Conservancy long ago and that are now this cornerstone of the NatureServe Network's uh, kind of assessment of conservation priorities. And these are uh, called conservation status ranks. And every species and plant community in Colorado gets a G and an S rank assigned to it by our program. And they work on a very simple system. Um, it's empirically based, you know, it's empirical data that we're using to assign these ranks. So it's based purely in science and the knowledge we have about them. And um, there are distinct thresholds for each of these uh, one through five ranks here. Um, but a, a general rule of kind of applies broadly to this is that a, 
a one is something that's critically imperiled, and generally there's five or less occurrences in the world uh, for a globally critically imperiled species. Um, so a species like that, I'm going to show you an example in a minute here, we get a G1, but something that is known from five or less occurrences just in the state of Colorado gets an S1. So we're able to look across different scales at rarity of, these, of, of our conservation elements by using this system. And so in this system, connects up to the IUCN's red list uh, ranks. Uh, IUCN red list does not have a, a means of doing the state rank system that we do, but um, their ranks equate to uh, uh, our global ranking system this way. A uh, critically endangered IUCN is roughly equivalent to a G1 species and so on. So these things can kind of be crosswalked. Um, so when you take that map that we looked at before and just look at the plants, and now we've color-coded the plants in Colorado by their global rarity. So we're looking at red as G1, orange is G2, yellow is G3. And when you do this, uh, th this is kind of an example of how our data support people's needs to identify conservation priorities and kind of set conservation strategies. So here you see these clusters of red dots. Those represent places on Earth where it's the last stand for a particular species because those G1s are only known from you know, one to five locations in the in the whole world. So we've taken this and turned it into a map that we call our potential conservation areas. And these pink areas here represent uh, the last stand for a particular species. This is where we have to conserve that species or lose it. And these are equivalent to areas for zero extinction um, that are identified by an international group called the Alliance for Zero Extinction. All of these are also analogous to IUCN's key biodiversity areas that are identified globally. So we are the entity that is identifying those places in Colorado. And our partners have used this map to do a lot of conservation. Like Jefferson County conserved 62% of all of the PCAs that we identified there in 1993 and had us come back in 2007 to identify more because they needed to add to their roadmap for their development of their open space program. Pitkin County is doing the same thing, and many other counties were done this. So um, these things have had a big impact on conservation. So uh, let's take a look at, at one of my favorite poster children species. This is Pinstemon debilis. It's a really cool little tiny matted Pinstemon that is only known from about six locations in the whole world. They're tiny populations. That's its global range on the map on the left, those purple dots. That's it in the whole world. And this is its habitat. Uh, this is at a place called Mount Callahan, where one of the biggest populations is. And uh, this is just kind of our intrepid botanist. This is just kind of another day in the office for them. But, uh, <laughs> but no, they. But this has been a, a site that we've been monitoring for our partners. Uh, especially with the Natural Areas Program. So um, here, here's, uh, so kinda how much of this do we think we have in the world? So we've done some research to try to try to figure that out. So this is a MaxEnt model of the distribution of Pinsman Debilis, and the red areas indicate very high probability. These are places we want to go have a look at and see if we find it. And, you know, all of those different colors indicate what we think the global range of this plant is likely to be. So even the model distribution of this is tiny on the face of the Earth. So this thing's just, it's an edaphic endemic. It's limited to just a few habitats in the world. So when you look at a species like this, you, know, you start to think, what kind of impacts is climate change going to have on this species? And we've been thinking about this across all of the species we track, and we have become very acutely aware of the need to understand that so that we can do something about it. Um, so we have several scientists. We have six scientists on staff, uh, Renee, Karen, Michelle, Lee, Jill, and Jeremy, who are all doing a lot of work on the climate change planning frontier, uh, working with 
a lot of partners um, working with NCCSC in particular. And we also have one talking head who talks about climate change a lot, and that's me. Um, and everything I do rests on the great work that these that these other folks are, are leading at CNHP right now. Um, and I think many of you on the phone and here in the room have worked with some of these folks over the years. Um, so, uh, so these are some of the climate change vulnerability products that we've been working on in collaboration with, with lots of other folks. Um, and so, you know, assessing climate change vulnerability is the first step to understanding what what's going on with our species and what can we possibly do about climate change. So, uh, the State Wildlife Action Plan has been a really exciting um, new development because plants were added to this new revision of the State Wildlife Action Plan. Um, and also in the upper right corner is the um, vulnerability assessment um, statewide for Colorado BLM. And so I'll talk a little bit about what came out of those. Um, one of the really exciting things that happened as a result of the State Wildlife Action Plan was uh, the, this award uh, for our team with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Natural Heritage Program, and NCCSC. So I assume you all already knew about this, but this was a really exciting um, acknowledgement of this partnership and of the um, vulnerability outcomes that we were able to generate collaboratively with the SWAP. So you've all seen this. Uh, this is the diagram from Glick et al., uh, which kind of maps out how we assess vulnerability. And so we've done that using many different methods. For the plants, we've used um, a tool called the Climate Change Vulnerability Index developed by NatureServe. Um, so anyway, uh, in theory, you combine your knowledge of exposure and sensitivity and look at potential impact and understanding the biology of the species incorporate it, whatever you can about its adaptive capacity to come up with a vulnerability score. Let's see what those look like. So here is the page um, out of the uh, BLM statewide uh, climate vulnerability plan with Pinsman Devilus on it. Here's Pinsman Devilus. EV stands for extremely vulnerable. So it gets a score of extremely vulnerable to climate change. And Wow, so did almost every other plant. As you can see, it's all red. Um, these are, uh, this is a list of 62 of Colorado's uh, most uh, rarest plants. These are BLM sensitive species. They're also now uh, species of greatest conservation need in our swap. And so why, why did we say they're all extremely vulnerable? Um, you know, for plants, it really kind of comes down to the fact that um, they have really just restricted distribution. These 62 species that we scored have tiny distributions on Earth, kind of like the one that we just looked at. So, you know, so that is this factor that makes them extremely vulnerable to climate change. For terrestrial ecosystems that we scored, um, we, uh, you know, that kind of boils down to the fact that. Uh, there's a lot of different factors, and the, the ones that really floated to the top here statewide were pinion and juniper and west slope riparian areas, and those really become focal points for where just a lot of other threats are happening as well. Fire, insects, grazing, lots of factors are conspiring to make these, these systems extremely vulnerable in Colorado. And for animals, uh, the fish really are the ones that are driving that extremely vulnerable category, and that's connected to water temperatures increasing. So, and you know, when you look at what's happening now, it's, it's not really surprising that you get results like this. So this diagram shows the current ecological envelopes for these major systems in Colorado. The, um, the points with the air bars around them represent the combination of precipitation and temperature that um, they exist in now. And those boxes represent the climate space that we expect those, the areas occupied by those systems to occupy by mid-century. So this is a diagram uh, from the State Wildlife Action Plan. So, you know, when you're working on vulnerability, that's just the first step. The goal is to get to adaptation. Like, so we know how vulnerable these things are. All those plants lit up red. 
what are we going to do about it? So this is some of the sort of liturgy that we've all been um, following as we work towards developing adaptation strategies. And so a good example of that is to just give you a, a really brief overview of what's happening with the Social Ecological Climate Resilience Project. Um, this is project was funded by the North Central Climate Science Center. Um, we are one of many partners on this project that's looking at uh, sort of understanding uh, social ecological resilience to climate change um, and uh, sort of how we can conserve uh, ecosystems and species while sustaining human communities. Um, the project area for this one is kind of two basins, uh, Gunnison Project Area and the San Juan Basin. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what's happening in the Gunnison. Uh, the work that we were involved with in the Gunnison actually preceded uh, the speaker project, but um, I'm talking about them in reverse order here. Um, so, um, so in these two basins, uh, the, the project uh, identified uh, four major landscapes, Kenyon Juniper, Sagebrush, Spruce Fir, and Seeps and Springs, which occur across all three of those other landscapes uh, throughout the study area. And we also identified uh, three key climate scenarios. This was led by MTS, um, who I think is on the phone. If you need to uh, shore up anything I'm saying here, please feel free to jump in. But these three scenarios, uh, kind of a hot and dry scenario where temps are high and precip is low, uh, a feast and famine scenario where we had really high variability between, in, in the outcomes of these models, we're seeing lots of droughts and floods and extreme kind of uh, um, climate events, and then a warm wet scenario where it's relatively uh, high precipitation. So those, um, so we've developed these logic models, which we call, are calling result chains um, for uh, um, the, the different landscapes um, in each one of those different scenarios, each one of those different climate scenarios. We being a very large group of people working on this. Um, and so here's an example of one of them for sagebrush. And the yellow boxes indicate things that we need to do to get to the purple boxes, which are our adaptation strategies. Um, so here's one of them that I'll show you some examples of, creating rock, pond, or log structures to reverse erosion and restore uh, mesic vegetation to these habitats is one uh, of these uh, outcomes that the result chain is indicating. These are the things we should do. So I'm going to talk with you about what that looks like on the ground through the work that the uh, um, Gunnison Basin Working Group is doing. Um, this work started in about 2010. Um, it was catalyzed by some funding for the, from the Southern Rockies LCC. Um, and we were part of this large team that Betsy Neely is kind of on the bottom left there. She's uh, been in a really important leadership role with all of this work. She's with Nature Conservancy. So, um, so thinking about the sagebrush system, you know, that is a very important system, both for human livelihoods um, and also for some really important species. A lot of rare species are uh, found in the sagebrush landscape. And also this, the, the Gunnison sage grouse. Um, and a really critical part of the Gunnison sage grouse life history is the, uh, uh, is the availability of um, uh, sort of headwater wetlands where the um, brood rearing can, can happen and the chicks are able then to feed on forbs and insects um, while they're young before they're able to live almost exclusively on a diet of sagebrush. So headwater wetlands are critical for the Gunnison and they also are an area where we identified um, lots of opportunities for improvement and kind of improvement. So the work that the Gunnison Basin Working Group is doing is, is taking the methods of Bill V. Dyke and putting them on the ground. Um, there's a whole sort of uh, uh, taxonomy of different kinds of uh, simple structures that can be installed in watersheds to improve 
improve the connectivity of the, um, uh, the water table to the floodplains and, and where you're experiencing severe erosion and downcutting and, and uh, impacts of uh, uh, less than optimal land management over many years. Uh, and the beauty of these uh, is that they're very, uh, they're simple uh, and easy to install. They just take a lot of uh, elbow grease at the beginning. So here's uh, one. This is, this one's called a Media Luna, and this one was installed uh, in the Gunnison Basin um, in 2012. And I got to go back and visit that Media Luna in 2016, and I'm standing on it right now looking down. This is Bev's Willow that has taken over where that Media Luna is that those people are working on. So it has it is amazing what's happening at these sites. We've been monitoring the vegetation, and it has um, the wetland vegetation has come back prolifically in this space, in this space, and, um, and really across the whole study area. 420 or so of these structures have been installed, and this coming summer there's going to be a whole bunch more. And it's really transforming this whole landscape. And the thing that I find so exciting about this is not only is this creating a landscape where sage grass can remain um, viable in the face of climate change, hopefully, but it's also creating benefits for humans. I mean, with better uh, places to graze cattle, um, we're going to see, uh, you know, uh, streams flowing much later in the summer because of this, and that translates directly into nature's benefits for people as well as for wildlife. So this is an example of an adaptation strategy that's really having a broad impact. And again, this is work uh, being done and funded by many, many different partners. Um, and so the last thing I wanted to touch on was some uh, work that we're doing to identify places where uh, ecosystems are being lost, where they're threatened, where they might be persistent, and where they're going to emerge. And um, so you break that down, um, that there's kind of a decision tree here that, that we are facing in the future now. Um, and, I, and I feel like this is really uh, kind of where we're at uh, in terms of uh, the work that the Colorado Natural Heritage Program can help support. Um, so as we kind of go through this decision tree, we see that um, you know, the, the fundamental question is, is there is a species present at a site right now? Um, yes or no? And then why? And we kind of get down to the boxes where it's either going to be persistent, emergent, or threatened and lost. And those square boxes indicate uh, management actions that need to happen. And so I think what the Colorado Natural Heritage Program brings to this whole arena is um, kind of being at the forefront of helping to connect managers with the climate science. Um, and sort of translating between science and managers is something that we've done for a long time. I mean, you know, our tagline is connecting conservation and science. And we exist in sort of a neutral space as part of a university. We're not a federal government agency or a state agency. We're not regulatory, and we're not an advocacy organization. So we exist in this space where we can help everybody and be sort of a node to be partners across the board. So. Um, kind of focusing on getting information to managers in such a way that they can actually use it is what we really feel we can bring to the table and are really excited about all of the climate change uh, science work and partnerships that we're engaged in right now. So that's, that's my story. Thank you all very much. I don't know if we have time for questions or discussion. Yeah, we could take some questions if anyone has them. Uh, hello, Dave. This is Jeff Morissette. I'm down in Denver and a little bit noisy, sort of coffee shop outside the meeting. So I was muted most of the time, but uh, thanks a lot for giving the talk and uh, describing all the things you're doing. And I think uh, sort of maybe for maybe not a question, but for comment from you and awareness for the others, one of the things we've been asked to do from our national office is integrate more with the state wildlife agencies uh, because that sort of has a lot of political uh, 
baggage, for lack of a better term, and uh, usually a uh, remit that's much larger than just uh, kind of ecology, biology, and uh, climate change. One strategy I propose is working with natural heritage programs uh, in that you, uh, in, as an example, in Colorado, and I believe in the other states in our domain, uh, do interact with the, the, the fish and game agencies, uh, but, but your uh, sort of kind of a, a boundary chain, we might say, where we're one link and the, the natural heritage programs would be another link where uh, you are steeped in the research, understand the biology, and in some ways understand a little more maybe about the, the politics of how that biology, ecology, climate change fits in with a, with a, with a state uh, uh, fish and game agency. And that's nothing to say uh, kind of negative about those agencies. I just think they have about a million other things to do. And I think we have a great working relationship in part because of you uh, building some bridges with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So uh, I, maybe that's just kind of, like I said, uh, information for the group. And if you have any comments on that kind of approach as sort of a, a boundary chain to connect better with states and kind of with the Climate Science Centers working with the natural heritage programs. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And um, it, yeah, it has really been wonderful to work with you uh, in pushing the uh, climate change part of the State Wildlife Action Plan forward. And uh, clearly, uh, from the recognition that you helped garner for that collaboration, that that's been a huge success. And I think that we're at a really good place with Parks and Wildlife right now, where where they 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 appear to be really ready to sort of embrace a proactive approach to, to these messages? I guess the larger question is, Dennis, is I, I think the Colorado program is a, a really strong one. I guess the, question, the larger question is, across the domain, the seven state region, how consistent are the um, heritage programs? Um, is, are there, you know, are they doing similar things, or are they really heterogeneous in that they're quasi-independent in how they operate? They're they're rather heterogeneous. Um, mm -hmm. That's yeah, one of the unique characteristics of this network is that there's there's a lot of heterogeneity, and that a lot of that is just based on their institutional homes. Um, you know, like we. Uh, you know, we've talked with the Nebraska Natural Heritage Program, um, know them quite well, and they are really interested in climate change, really interested in partnering with us, but they face some limitations in capacity because they are part of the Nebraska DNR. They lack the ability that we have at CNHP to just, if we can demonstrate to the university that we have money to hire someone, we can hire somebody. We don't have to go through the state legislature to get an FTE to bring on a new staff person. Mm -hmm. And so um, that uh, has led them to sort of invite us to work on climate change issues in Nebraska. If we can procure resources and partnerships to do that, then they are all in. They would love to partner with us on that. Um, and I think that they'd rather see folks like us do it than somebody else, and they are willing to make their data available and their, you know. So, yeah, so there's, it, it really varies. Um, you have programs like Wyoming where they are very much like us. They are scientists at a university and they they can pursue funded projects. The same so way like the Colorado, Wyoming, Montana was University-based. Yes. And the other ones yeah. are more state-based. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, Kansas is university-based, but they operate on a little different model. Um, and they're not. They're they're one of our states. Aren't yes. They? Okay. Sorry. Yep. It's hard to keep all the maps in my head. But um, yes, I don't know. They're they. As far as I know, we have like two staff and their faculty members. Uh, okay. 
Anyway, but they, I think they can. I think they have our, our abilities to sort of. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, so since you got the list first, an endangered species from BLM, for example, how would you advise for a new area where there does not exist any listing? Uh, you know, how do you advise? You know, we go about you know documenting you know or studying the species. Okay. That's a good question. Um, that list from BLM has been one that has evolved over many years, and, and our programs data have really supported the identification of what BLM sensitive species are. So their decision to have a sensitive species is resting to a very large degree on our data. Same with Forest Service um, sensitive species, which are now called, um, I can't, I just, they changed it in the new forest planning rules, and I don't know why it won't stick in my head, but Forest Service also, especially now, is using the G ranks and S ranks to determine what species they pay attention to on a particular forest. So, so that so that list is, is something that's evolved over many years of, of research on the ground to figure out how rare these things really are, and to identify new areas. You know, it'll be a combination of field work, um, modeling. You know, trying to find the places where these species exist and working with BLM. A lot of these areas that are on BLM land are now uh, have some kind of BLM special designation. They'll um, be uh, um, areas of critical ecological, or areas of critical environmental concern is one of the ways that BLM can separate areas into different. Your question? Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, I guess, you know, yeah, I'm wondering so, like, there are a lot of past areas known in the U.S. across the world where they have not been documented. You know, oh, yeah. Why would be the role of citizen science in reporting, you know, what unique species they think are, should be, I don't know. So. Oh, yeah, it's, there's so much. Even in Colorado, where we've had botanists here working hard for a long time, we're still finding new species. Um, we found there's been new discoveries of insects and plants here. Um, kind of amazing that you keep, keep finding new things. Yeah. Maybe one time for one more question before we go on to the updates, if anyone has one. Hi, Dave. This is Imtiaz. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so one thing I was looking when I was looking at your the vulnerability graphs for ecosystem species and animals, uh, the plants and animals separately. Uh, the thought came to me is, you know, so if you see the ecosystem as not being that vulnerable, but at the species level you see much more vulnerability, then what's the thinking there? I mean, going forward, um, that should be emphasized ecosystem or then the species? Uh, these ones in yes? Yes. Okay, and the question is, why are the species more vulnerable than the ecosystems? Right, and then uh, more in the direction of, what, is there a recommendation? I mean, what do you think of as a, uh, from, yeah, I know you don't do advocacy, but, you know, here uh, as a society, you know, should we be thinking in terms of protecting ecosystem function and the focus should be on ecosystems or should it come down to individual species? Uh, and I, I don't know what, where does CNHP stand on that? Yeah, well, we don't advocate, but we recommend. Um, <laughs> so. It's good to know, yeah. <laughs> um, that's a really good question and it kind of gets back to some of that um, you know, like fine versus coarse filter thinking. Um, and, you know, a lot of these, these extremely vulnerable plants and animals are fine filter species. They're found in really specific limited habitats which may be, whose, whose climate envelopes are changing drastically. So if we want to still have those species, we aren't going to be able to solve those problems on the level of a terrestrial ecosystem we're going to have to do something different um, specific to those species. And 
um, we're kind of working on what some of those adaptation strategies might look like. But we definitely don't know the answer to that question yet. Um, but you raise a really good question in terms of sort of the level at which to focus and the ecosystem processes are critical and I, I like that aspect of the Gunnison Basin work that, that sort of identified some key processes that we can actually have an impact on and address those. And those, I think when we are successful, we're looking for adaptation opportunities that are going to really uh, transcend a, a lot of different levels of, of uh, ecosystems and, and benefits from nature. So yeah, that's, I don't really know the full answer to your question, but that, that I think is sort of the big issue we have to confront. And as in our roles, I think we have to be ready to help answer that question for people on a, you know, within the areas they're managing. Thanks, Dave. Sure, thank you. Your, your presentation today. Um, so now let's move on just to some um, short updates from the foundational science areas. Dennis, would you like to go first? Um. <laughs> Do you have any updates? Sure. Um, briefly, I think um, we had our sort of PI meeting last week. Um, that was very useful um, on the adaptation working group. It's sort of there's elements related to looking at how we move forward with actionable science and um, some interest in how we kind of are looking at some of the social science methodologies are looking at co-production um, contributing to um, actionable science. Um, recently, um, being last Friday, um, Steve Daly Larson uh, brought a group together that was advising um, USDA on um, natural resources and energy, and um, we shared. Uh, he asked me to share some of the insights that uh, we're developing within the Climate Science Center efforts, and uh, presented some of the um, slides that we use in Scamania to the uh, director's meetings. So that was um, quite useful, um, getting the feedback from the USDA Advisory Committee. Um, I think I'll, yeah, I think I'll stop, stop there um, for now. Okay. Um, Shannon, do you have anything you want to add here? So I don't, have any updates from since our meeting we just had the other day, but you guys had asked me to talk about the National Climate Assessment technical inputs. Do you want me to still talk about that? Sure. Do you want to um, give me the screen so that I can show people the, the form and everything? Yep. And remind me what I need to do on my end. Um, after I get the little ball to you, um, you need to click on share screen. So um, up at the top, there's a share tab. Not letting me do anything. Oh wait, I guess it's thinking. Is it, are you seeing my screen now? No, not yet. Hmm. Do you see the- My screen. There, okay, it's coming, yeah. Cool. Okay. All right, you see the USGCRP site now? Yes. Okay. So um, Dennis just wanted me to show you guys really quickly about the National Climate Assessment, the upcoming National Climate Assessment um, process for submitting technical input. So we encourage 
everybody to um, submit any recent publications over the last several years to be reviewed for the upcoming National Climate Assessment. So um, this is the page that you go to, it's contribute.globalchange.gov. You will need to register. And once you register and have a login, um, you go to this page, which is public nominations for authors and for technical inputs. The public nominations um, deadline has uh, closed. So this is really just for technical inputs at this stage. So this tells you about the technical inputs and um, the process and all of that. And then you go down here, you can see once you submit, you'll have, I submitted one just to do a test run. Um, you'll have a record here. You'll be able to, to view and go back and edit and delete and do whatever if you want to of your inputs. I've only submitted one so far. But you click on this link here. Um, you can see here the they, they ask that you submit by November 1st. That's in a week. So probably not realistic, but they're accepting them through January 15th, 2017. You go here. And then this tells you about the submission, and this is the form for submission. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy. It takes about two minutes per submission. Um, the important thing here also to note is that whichever chapter you want to review your, your publication, you'll select. So these are all of the different um, chapters. You can select many for each publication. Um, and then you submit, and that's pretty much it. Thanks a lot, Shan. This is Jeff. Hopefully, you know, his background noise isn't too bad. Can you uh, just make a question on that checklist? Can you check more than one on the chapters? You can. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yep. So I, I would ask that somehow we think about compiling uh, if anyone funded with CSC uh, projects or affiliated, you know, sort of time coverage or otherwise uh, leveraging off the Climate Science Center, that we somehow track that. Um, and I don't, it doesn't look like there's maybe a way to say in here like where you're getting your funding for that particular paper, but maybe if people submit things, they could do some screen capture or somehow uh, note that, you know, uh, you know, Shannon submitted five and we could, you know, we could search, you know, kind of make sure that, you know, uh, their, their database to see Shannon McNeely and find those five. But I think it would be very useful for our five-year review uh, to to have the number of inputs that we provided to the, the, this uh, this work. Uh, hopefully, we have a lot to contribute, and I uh, ask people to take the time to do that, and then uh, they could uh, I don't know who we communicate with. Uh, maybe Dennis, Jill, and I. You could send a note and just say you you submitted X number of publications under your name, and we could work on compiling that and, and making sure we we note that contribution. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I think it would be useful when someone submits just to send us an email when they do that with the publication that they actually submitted. That way we have the actual you know, sort of citation or whatever as well. Yeah, I think that would be the easiest way to handle it is just people reporting to us when they submit and what they submit. So. Okay, thanks, Shannon. Sure thing. All right. This is Diane. Can I follow up on that uh, commentary? Could sure. you all send us an email with that link and say, you know, so we can find it easily so that we can follow up on this conversation? Sure. Okay. That's Thanks. Okay. Great. All right. Let's see. Um, uh, Andy, would you like to go next? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great seeing you all down in uh, Fort Collins. Uh, two weeks ago now. Um, not much new to report here. Um, we, we do have a WebEx scheduled for Friday with um, four or five of our collaborators from uh, Yellowstone and Rocky Mountain National Park to talk about um, some progress on, on projects. So we're looking forward to that. And then, Arjun, I wonder if you have uh, any comments about the work you've been doing this this week and last? Uh, I muted it because of lots of noises. Yeah, I have some um, something I have done uh, regarding assessing uh, 
the climate uh, data analyzing the climate data sent by Imtiaz and his team it's uh, great and uh, still I'm waiting for some more uh, data but those are uh, very good and uh, just uh, preparing uh, or inserting in the systems to run the species distribution modeling uh, and the other thing I am also working on to pre uh, working to prepare uh, research briefs for our nine greater wild wildland ecosystems and that is all and we have updated all the things that what we did during our annual meeting in Fort uh, Collins last week. Okay, thanks. I think that's all from us. Um, just a little addition, I guess, um, to our to the uh, larger group about what we discussed last uh, two weeks ago. Um, I think a planning process is is um, starting up for a workshop on looking at sort of the climate interactions with um, evapotranspiration and PET calculations. So we'll, you'll see something emerge on that. Um, the coming weeks uh, for a workshop that probably will take place either in um, April or Mar um, May of 17. This is some sort of discussion that um, we have with Andy and Imtiaz and Arjun um, and a couple others. So people like Gabriel will be involved with that for sure um, and the work that Bill Parton is doing. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, uh, Dennis. Look, we're looking forward to it. Okay, thanks. Um, let's go, um, MTS and Candida. Yes, hi, everyone. Uh, yes, it was great to be uh, in Fort Collins two weeks ago and uh, have all that discussion and meet so many of the other uh, folks who are probably on the phone. Um, so, yeah, a quick update. Uh, 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 Arjun mentioned some of the data we've been providing him uh, that's kind of coming out of this mock downscaled data set, which is kind of a constructed analog based data, data set at four kilometers. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, daily data, and then what something we are downscaling it to 800 meters, I mean, disaggregating it further to 800 meters um, and giving it to Arjun. And, um, at the same time, we're kind of developing this data set uh, and all the codes related to that uh, in-house so we can uh, provide similar data for other research purposes. Um, and so Arjun, I just wanted to mention that we, I will get to the, the other data related to relative humidity, vapor pressure deficit uh, shortly. Uh, but the other data set that I provided, Arjun, are you know some of the common variables like temperature, uh, team, team and Tmax, uh, precip, um, speed, solar radiation, and then derive variables like uh, potential evapotranspiration and uh, uh, aridity index. So I, we hope to create uh, you know more of these data sets for different models. Right now we just uh, uh, you know provided one results from just one model, output from just one model, and uh, going forward. Um, We'll be a little more selective because the daily data set are just uh, uh, working with uh, some of these data sets just takes a long time. So just be more selective what models we going to provide early and then be a whole suite of data sets going forward. Um, also, uh, 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 Dave's talk earlier reminded me that we have been also providing uh, and working with some of the CNFP folks uh, and providing them the eddy data. Um, and uh, historical eddy data to look to explore some impacts in uh, to uh, different ecosystem response uh, that they are interested in. So, um, and uh, we are kind of working out here to kind of uh, again streamline that process where we can give historical eddy, which is the evaporative demand drought index uh, data to folks who need it. Um, um, we, since we didn't have a call last last time, last month, uh, just this update that 
um, the paper that Kidita has been leading on uh, you know, looking at how different methodologies to calculate PET gives very different results with respect to, you know, especially the future uh, drought risk assessment. And uh, that's been in review. So, and, and so the next step is um, uh, following up from that paper, you know, using the best practices to calculate PET and, and then using the MACA data to kind of project uh, what is the envelope of risk in kind of uh, in the NCCSE regions. Um, Dennis, I got your email about the MACA data, and I just, a quick comment here is that, I mean, I think MACA data is, you know, one of the better data sets out there, uh, and since it's the daily data, it's kind of, it's, uh, it's, a, it's kind of an appropriate time scale to do to, to work on extremes. And so uh, the other data set that kind of just getting more news is the LOCA data. Is, uh, it's uh, something like a local constructed analogs. Um, and, um, I, you know, we are still exploring, you know, are there major differences between the two? But, I, I mean, I, at this point, uh, I don't see um, one being better than the other. Uh, and, uh, I, and I like certain methods in MACA, which I don't want to go and do it right now. But, uh, and we are making, we have made some decision here to go ahead with MACA. Uh, for our, at least for near future research. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. I guess it, just a, a follow up on on some of these uh, some of those questions I, I sent you with this advisory committee that I'm on the vulnerability impacts assessment um, consortium committee or something. I can't. It's VX. It, it's it's dealing with TMIP um, six um, data sets, and so some of the questions is, what are the various methodologies um, useful for various um, impact assessment activities? And so I think I may try to follow up with you on, and in, in, in some of the thinking that we might incorporate into that um, advisory committee as they. Um, provide input into schema six activities and data um, and model intercomparisons. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we are a little afraid of schema six already because yeah, we're still dealing with schema five. But. No, it's it's, a, it's yeah, it's getting more complicated. Um, so but anyway, I think there's an opportunity there providing some input. Sure. And I, I know we're short on the call on time. Uh, this is Jeff to say that you know, I think if any of the uh, decision support or management focused projects could uh, entertain utilizing the MACA data, I think we should try to get get access uh, or, or help uh, in them doing so because at the end of the day, you can look at the climate data and how it compares with other climate data sets, but the implications for what it means on the resource side and uh, the ecological response would be uh, would be of keen interest, I think. Yeah, sure. And maybe we can bring in MACA data into Climate Trimmer in, on a future date, uh, at least, uh, you know, certain aspects of it. And just to let folks know, we've got a call. I believe Candida is going to be on. I don't know if MTSU will be on the Topo Weather with Jared Euler uh, and Steve running on Thursday to talk about a precip data set for uh, for uh, Topo Weather. Public, you can get your ticket by visiting the full story at source.colostate.eu. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Nice plug there at the end. Yeah. <laughs>